Hi everyone, um, thanks for coming today. It's great to see so many of you here. So this is the second session for this Fish, Fisheries and Carbon workshop. Um, my name's Emma Cavan. I'm a research fellow at Imperial College London and will be co-hosting today with Simeon Hill. So I'll hand over to Simeon to properly start the workshop. Thanks, Emma. Yes, so I'm Simeon Hill from the British Antarctic Survey, and I'm just going to provide a few introductory slides on today's workshop. So as Emma mentioned, this is the, um, the second session of the OCB Fish, Fisheries and Carbon workshop. Uh, I'm sure some of you will join the Monday session that was led by Grace and Lauren. Today's session on fishery impacts on carbon sinks will be led by Emma and myself. And then we have a third session tomorrow led by Rashid and Rebecca on um, societal impacts uh, when managing uh, fish stocks to protect carbon. And um, the session leads are ably supported by Heather, May and Mary who are working seamlessly behind the scenes. So the eight, today's aims are to identify the knowledge and data gaps that need filling to represent the role of higher trophic levels in biogeochemical bio models and to include protection of ocean carbon sinks in fishery management policy. Um, the way today is going to be organized is we're gonna start the first half with some uh, some talks. So we have four plenary speakers followed by four lightning talks. I will introduce the, the plenary speakers and Emma will introduce the lightning talks. Then about halfway through the workshop, we'll have a quarter hour break and then we'll have some um, interactive discussions, uh, which we, we, we hope to wrap up um, in uh, around, well, 1735 my time. And then we'll have a, a short um, summary of, of where we got to in those discussions and some closing comments from Emma. Uh, um, this, the, the topics that we'll address in the breakout discussions are, are listed below. Sorry about the numbering. Um, and so uh, this gives you the chance to, to start thinking about how to answer them. Um, I'll introduce the breakout sessions by, by going through the specific process by which we'll address these questions. So the first, the first question is about gaps in knowledge and prioritization of research to fill these knowledge gaps. The second question is about the available tools and data that exist at the moment for filling these knowledge gaps. And the third question is about how could fisheries management help to limit the impacts of fishing on the ocean carbon cycle? So that's the brief introduction. Um, we will return to the uh, plenary speakers first, uh, sorry, soon, but first I'll hand over to Heather, who will uh, uh, introduce uh, a couple of polling questions for us to get to know each other. Okay, everyone, I've put a link to a Menti poll in the chat. We can get a sense of where everybody is who's joining us today. People from Asia, Australia, New Zealand get extra points because I know it's in the middle of the night. All right, we're starting to level out on this question. So I am going to move us to the next question. We've still got people coming, hold on, <laughs> okay. All right, next question. In a short word or phrase, please share your primary motivation. Why are you here today? What about this session drew you in or this workshop? That's very cool to see. We all we all want to learn a lot, so that's good. Hopefully, we will. Awesome. Thanks, Heather. Thank you, Heather. So, um, so now we're going to move on to our plenary talks. The first talk is from uh, my co-lead today, which is Emma Cavan from Imperial College, and she's going to talk about where we are in fishery carbon science. Great. So, yeah, I'm just going to give an overview of. Um, uh, basically kind of my thoughts on where I think we are in, in fishery carbon science and I uh, obviously cannot capture everything um, but hopefully it will be useful for stimulating further discussion and get you thinking about the discussion groups. 
so my personal kind of arrival at being really interested in about how fisheries might be impacting the ocean carbon pump was through work on uh, the Southern Ocean ecosystems. And that's something that Simeon and I um, kind of separately, but also together, both really interested in those polar Southern Ocean Antarctic ecosystems. And so we, we wrote this paper um, with a bunch of other awesome co-authors um, that was published in 2019 really looking into how Antarctic krill interact with biogeochemical cycles, their role in the biological carbon pump, but also with nutrients and fertilization and loads of other cool stuff. But uh, you can't really discuss Antarctic krill without thinking about the fact that they are fish. And so for Simeon and I, this was the first time we thought, okay, well, maybe fisheries are you know, having an impact, particularly when they're fishing out some really important species in terms of sinking carbon into the deep. So then Simon and I um, kind of got together and thought about what we could do to move this forward. And so we published this paper um, last year and we kind of thought about all the ways that fisheries might be interacting with the ocean carbon cycles. And so you can see these, um, the text here, which shows the topics we thought about. We actually didn't discuss CO2 emissions at all, but they're um, really important. So I'm gonna briefly talk about them today. But um, these five things are things that we really want you to think about in the discussion, but also like what boxes are missing here? What stuff, what subjects are we missing and have we not spoken about? So um, yeah, keep that in mind. So firstly, to think about the removal of biomass from the oceans. So removal of biomass, and harvesting of fish or other animals can really decline the ocean carbon pump. So that can be through decreasing the carbon flux to the sea floor from feces, carcasses, you know, dead bodies, and also molts from crustaceans um, and they're shedding the exoskeletons. Um, and also it can reduce the transfer of CO2 to the deep as part of active migration. So this is through fish and squid and crustaceans particularly. And on shorter time scales, that removing that biomass from the ocean, you know, there is a there is a component of carbon which is stored as living biomass in the ocean. And I think really this work was kind of you know stemmed from earlier work of Grace Sabers that she presented on Monday and how she accidentally found all these fish fecal pellets where she was looking for zooplankton. And, you know, that kind of alerted um, the biological carbon pump community to thinking, OK, well, maybe fish are really important in sinking carbon and we're, we're really missing something by just focusing on the plankton. And similarly, there was also uh, lots of other work in the last decade to try and qu quantify the biomass of mesopelagic fish, because this is mostly an untapped fishery it's not really harvested and so um, there's work to kind of think how many mesopelagic fish are there but also because they live a bit deeper in the ocean what is their contribution to carbon and to total carbon export so from these background work and um, the work on krill then I'll just come back to this paper that Simon and I wrote together and so we wanted to assess kind of globally and spatially, where do we have really high carbon export, which is that top left. So this is carbon sticking out of the surface ocean. And where do we have really high fishing intensity? So that's the top right plot. And then in the bottom map in these orange pixels, that shows the locations where you have both high carbon export from the, you know, mostly from the plankton carbon pump and also high fishing intensity. And this map is not causal. We're not saying that in these areas, fishing is definitely interacting with the carbon pump or it's definitely having a negative impact. What we're saying is these areas are where we need to be careful about, or not careful, sorry, but you know, uh, priority areas for future research. And what's interesting is we expected it to be fairly coastal because you get high primary production and high fisheries around the coasts. But you'll see that there are some high open ocean, you know, um, areas in the open ocean. So in the North Atlantic and the Pacific, Pacific. Um, and that's, you know, last week we had the UN um, treaty signed for the high seas. So it's really exciting that now we could possibly manage these open ocean areas potentially for fishing um, to, you know, manage them, the fisheries to protect carbon. But to see if there is a causal impact on fisheries, then we need, you know, modeling studies. And in the last few years, you know, this is a really new topic that's rapidly developing. So it's really exciting to be here today in this meeting. Um, and there have been quite a few studies which have tried or which have looked at particularly globally how fishing out biomass can interact with biogeochemicals and cycling. And hopefully Danielle will be telling us about that in a minute. So then 
to move on to benthic trawling and resuspended sediment. And this has become, again, as well, another huge area in ocean science in the last few years. But it's not just limited to the last few years. And I think it's important that we remember that there are decades worth of literature, but in our Google Scholar of, you know, benthic trawling carbon, they might not come up because the older literature wasn't always necessarily focused on carbon, but still had, you know, was investigating the impact of resuspending sediments. Um, sorry, of trawling on resuspending sediments. And you can see this here from this 1980s paper where uh, the resuspension of sediment is similar, whether it's by, uh, in some cases, by resuspended currents or by um, trawling. But then there was this uh, really massive paper that got loads of media attention by Henri Sale et al, which kind of um, took the kind of historic research and applied it and said, well, if we have all this trawling, because we know how much fishing and trawling is happening, what does that mean for loss of CO2 to the atmosphere through trawling? And there was big headline studies, which is trawling for fish may unleash as, as much carbon as air travel. Now, you may remember that from a few years ago, it's kind of international news, but it's really, this paper has stimulated loads, I mean, in a really good way, it's really stimulated loads of research to see if this is true, if it does, is if it is that much um, CO2 loss globally, and if it varies at all. And one of such papers is by Epstein et al. Um, in 2022, and they reviewed all the literature that does exist on, um, on all the different studies on the change in organic carbon and the percentage. So just to take you through this bar plot, we've got um, the total number of papers they, they looked at that were influencing organic carbon. And so from this is split by sediment types. So you've got muddy sediments, sandy sediments. So they have an equal number of studies that were looking at the percentage change in organic carbon. Um, and then there were some studies that found that carbon did decrease in the sediments after trawling, but only nine out of 25 for muds and five out of 24 for sand. And most studies actually found no effect on benthic trawling, and some actually found an increase. So this just shows there's large variabilities, which will be linked to different environmental factors and loads of other uh, different um, kind of parameters, if you will. But thankfully, we have loads of studies coming out and lots of funding in this research now to um, move that forward. And we're going to be hearing from Lucas Paws about a paper published by themselves and, and Zhang et al. Um, very soon. So then I'm going to briefly just touch on um, trophic cascades. So trophic cascades, we know from ecology, can change community composition um, in food webs and impact fisheries. And it's the removal of these mid to high trophic levels may be changing the lower trophic level community structure where a lot of carbon and export flux occurs. So this is particularly important if we fish higher predators out and that has a cascading effect on the lower biomass, uh, sorry, high biomass organisms like phytoplankton, zooplankton, krill and other big zooplankton and small pelagic fish. And because these big biomass um, organisms are really the ones that are driving the, the carbon sinks. But there is lots more to do on this topic. And I, and I do know of some, um, some work that will be coming out the next few years through different funding and hopefully we'll be hearing from Rick for a, in a lightning talk as well um, touching on this. So I'm just going to briefly go over CO2 emissions now and I'm not going to say anything about deadfalls because I don't know that there is a lot of information out there but I just want to highlight that you know Simon and I had this had this idea that if we inject a lot of mass into the deep ocean of like dead um, biomass that wasn't taken back to shore you know does that change deep ocean biogeochemistry and oxygen in any meaningful capacity. But to go to um, CO2 emissions now, of course, uh, vessels, fishing vessels are fueled by fossil fuels and they release a large amount of CO2 equivalent greenhouse gases and potentially contribute 4% of food production. And this map, um, sorry, this graph is quite interesting. It has the black line, solid black line is the catch, fishery catch over time. And the gray background shows the fuel emissions. And so it suggests that actually the catch in tons of catch of fish um, has kind of stabilized or maybe is declining, but that the, the CO2 emissions are still increasing. And so fisheries are becoming less efficient. And there's still lots of fuel subsidies in place, which you know, support this, um, this fishery industry, which potentially wouldn't be economically viable without these subsidies. And just to highlight that, that um, you know, the catch, you can also see the disproportionate in the kind of total landings from different species versus greenhouse gas emissions. So the orange 
bars here represent crustaceans and they're only a small percentage of total landings but actually on the right the orange bars for crustaceans is quite high in their fuel emissions and Erica is going to be giving a, a plenary in a moment to um, talk about CO2 emissions more. So just a reminder think about these things think about what we're missing you know tell us things that I've missed today in the discussion really interested to know more about what else what other research is is going on here but there's loads of work to do on this and it's just really exciting to be here today and um, looking forward to the discussions and the talks thanks thank you very much Emma um, uh, before um, asking for questions um, in fact I'll just uh, explain that the format for asking questions, if, if people have questions, please, could you put them in the in the chat? Um, but I'll just make an inquiry about um, Daniele um, while we're waiting for people to provide their questions. So um, does anybody know whether Daniele has joined us yet? He has not joined us yet. We have sent him three or four reminders via email, so I don't know if he got his time zones mixed okay. up but we will well, continue to try to get in touch with him if you want to okay move so on i to the next try and stay reasonably well to time we haven't actually had any questions um in the um in the chat so i will just ask you emma if you had to choose one <laughs> of the ecological impacts of fishing this is this is uh excluding the, the co2 emissions which is likely to be the most significant which which do you think it is Hang on, sorry, say that again. I was distracted by looking at the what? chat. That's really awful, isn't it? <laughs> which, of, which, <laughs> sorry, which of the various ecological impacts of yes. fishing on the on the um, uh, carbon sink that you've you've explained to us, which do you think is likely to be the most significant? <sighs> I'm gonna well, maybe I'll give a rubbish answer, which is it all depends on time scales and scales. But um, you know, I think that. You know, some aspects trawling because if it's locked in sediments and it's going to be there, you know, that's carbon sequestered for, tech, you know, maybe millennia. But then if we're just trawling over the same stuff land we've always trawled over, then maybe that's not so bad. Um, and in which case, I think that uh, fishing small species, which have really high biomass, I think is one of the um, bigger impacts because, um, you know, the like the krill and small pelagics are really efficient in you know, um, exporting carbon quickly through a small trophic level chain and small food web. So, yeah, I think keeping the small stuff in, which is maybe against, um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think it depends on what aspect you're looking at, which is unhelpful, but that's why it's so complex. And that's why biology is so interesting. That's great. Thank you. And everybody else will have a ch chance to answer a similar question when we get to the interactive discussion. So, Erica, are you ready to speak now? I'll just I'll just mention that we have had uh, a, a questions come on, come into the chat while we've been speaking, Emma. And I so what we did um, on Monday's session was the um, the presenters engaged with the the questions using the chat, and we could do that. But I wonder if we should just hold off on that until the end of, um, until until we've had our three speakers, because we may have some extra time when we could take extra questions. So please, uh, everybody, as questions come come along, please type them into the chat. So our next speaker is Erica Ferrer. Is that, I hope I pronounced that correctly, thank you. She's a PhD candidate at Scripps Institute of Oceanography. She completed her Bachelor of Science degree in marine biology with a minor in chemistry, at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and her current doctoral research in Octavio Abertos lab in, at Scripps includes a number of interdisciplinary projects from quantifying the carbon footprint of common seafood products in Baja California to experimentally testing the effects of climate stress on local fishery taxa. And Eric is also keen to contribute to socially just environmental solutions for issues such as overfishing, biodiversity loss and climate change. And she's going to speak to us today about fishery emissions in a blue carbon context. So thank you very much, Erica. Uh, well, thanks so much, Emma. I feel like you set up uh, a great stage for me to um, go ahead and give this talk. And uh, actually, I think this will work well with Danielle's talk following. So just to give a brief 
outline of uh, my talk, I'm going to start with a very quick recap of blue carbon and the biological pump and move on to the carbon footprint of fisheries and seafood. I'll then discuss some of my own research and the relationship between overfishing and emissions. From there, I'll highlight the work of myself and colleagues having to do with the carbon perks of fisheries restoration, and I'll end with general takeaways. In this workshop so far, we've spent a lot of time talking about this part of the biological pump and the oceanic food web, carbon that sinks from the upper ocean into the ocean's deep sea through physical, biological, and chemical processes is the carbon we would typically think of as blue carbon. For the purpose of this talk, however, uh, I wanted to integrate the other half of the food web, which involves us humans as apex predators. Our fishing boats, which we use to land about 100 million tons of wild catch seafood every year, serves as a small though non-negligible portion of all anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, and they have tangible effects on fish carbon in the ocean. Now, food in general accounts for about one third about, of all anthropogenic carbon emissions, and wild catch fisheries specifically account for anywhere between 0.3 and 1% of total emissions. This number very varies though, depending on specific assumptions that you make or accounting specifications revealed in the literature. One thing I'd like to note before moving on is that relative to other types of seafood, relative to other types of food, seafood remains understudied and underrepresented in the sustainable diet literature. To give a quick overview of how fisheries are doing around the world, landings have largely stagnated since the 1990s, although fishing technology and fuel use, as Emma has mentioned, has continued to grow, which has given rise to continued uh, growing emissions. The lion's share of wild catch is derived from the marine environment and anywhere from 25 to 50 percent of all landings come from small scale fisheries. Interestingly, about half of the world seafood is now derived from aquaculture and this proportion is growing. So for those of you who are interested in, uh, you know, the next frontiers of this research, I think incorporating the footprint of aquaculture um, is a is furtive ground. So in this context, it's become all the more urgent to understand the environmental footprint of fishing, uh, including carbon footprint, but not limited to. And across the food systems literature, our knowledge of seafood carbon footprint is limited to a relatively small number of empirical studies, which I'm going to flag throughout the talk and at the end of this talk. Uh, typically, we use what's called a life cycle assessment model uh, to uh, account for all the sources of emissions. So so for all the sources of emissions shown here on this right-hand graph, which shows a full cradle to grave uh, life cycle assessment of any given product, I'm going to focus on those generated by raw extraction. Um, and raw extraction for the case of fishing can uh, include a wide number of sources from burning fossil fuels to the emissions generated by ecosystem perturbations and so on. One quick note about units that you're going to see in this talk. Um, this unit here, CO2 EQ, refers to the kilograms of various greenhouse gas emissions, including methane and nitrogen dioxide, converted to one common unit of CO2. Okay, so pausing for a second, now I'm going to pivot to uh, the, the actual research of the talk. Uh, if we put all these methods for life cycle analyses to the test, my colleagues and I were able to quantify the emission intensity profiles of seven common seafood products fished throughout Mexico. And what we found was that the carbon footprint of seafood varies widely. For example, the carbon footprint of demersal mollusks shown on up top uh, is equal to that of about produce and the footprint of shrimp is on par with ruminant herbivores, beef, goat, sheep. For comparison, the green box here denotes the approximate range in carbon footprint for an 100% plant-based diet. As you can see, several of the seafood products landed by small-scale fisheries in Mexico represent what I and many others would probably consider climate-friendly food options. And for those of you who study fisheries, this disparity in emission intensity might not come as much of a surprise. It's most likely explained by the type of gears used to fish these organisms. So for example, in this part of the world, mollusks are often landed using air supplied hookah tools, uh, whereas shrimp are landed using uh, small and medium sized trawl nets that are very heavy as they scrape across the seafloor. So while wrapping up that study as part of my dissertation, I began to ponder the, of, 
variability that occurs within groups. And looking at the data, I had a hunch that at least part of this spread might be con might uh, be explained by underlying stock status and available biomass. I began to consider the role that overfishing might play in driving emissions. The logic behind this idea is grounded in the age-old concept of catch per unit effort and goes something like this. As overfishing increases, available biomass declines. With fewer fish available in the sea, average fuel intensity of, of any particular boat and the fleet goes up, and so too do overall emissions. So to me, the logic behind this idea seems fairly intuitive and compelling, uh, but like so much of what I've already said in this talk, not a lot of empirical studies to ground it. So I'm going to share with you two examples of research that, that I believe advances this argument pretty well. But first, let's talk about biomass and the definition of overfishing versus overfished. So one measure of available biomass is what we call B versus BMSY, the ratio of current day biomass in a given stock to the biomass of that stock at some magical hypothetical point maximum sustainable yield. Maximum sustainable yield, or MSY, as many of you know it by, refers to the higher, highest possible value of annual catch that can be sustained over time. That is the highest amount of fish you can extract uh, from a population without depleting it. Overfishing is estimated as the current fishing mortality versus fishing mortality at MSY. It's the actual act of taking too much fish. In contrast, BBMSY tells us if that stock has been kind of chronically overfished. So I thought this was a good proxy in that it kind of gave us a better idea of, um, of what had been happening to stocks over time and a better idea of how fishers might be targeting uh, stocks in Mexico. And I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, but what you need to know for the slides moving forward is that when BBMSY is equal to one, that stock is considered to have a healthy biomass and is generally considered a sustainable fishery. When BBMSY values are greater than one, that suggests the fishery is doing really well and the biomass is kind of above what you might hope for. Uh, and when BBMSY values are less than one, uh, this should generally be avoided. So uh, values of BBMSY less than 0.05 are generally considered overfished. So using the same data set that I showed you uh, to generate emissions profiles for small scale seafood products, uh, I was able to combine uh, those data with landings data from the Mexican government uh, to generate stock assessment profiles for these uh, data poor fisheries. And um, combining these, we were able to test the relationship between relative stock biomass and fuel intensity per kilogram of seafood. And here's what we saw in terms of raw data shown in panel A. Uh, this figure shows the estimated biomass versus fuel intensity, sorry, shown in panel B. Uh, for every individual fishing trip in the database originating for fisheries with more than 10 records of fuel consumption on file and at least 10 years worth of landings data. Panel A is essentially a summary that shows the XY coordinates for this data averaged by fishery. And if we apply a mixed effects model to these data or a simple linear regression, uh, we see statistically significant relationship between higher fuel intensity uh, and lower biomass. So this relationship, which holds up under a variety of model parameterizations and robustness checks, suggests that an end to overfishing would indeed lower the carbon footprint of seafood. It follows that if stock biomass were to increase, if you were to restore a fishery, that fuel intensity would likely decline. And presumably so too would fishery emissions. And to test this hypothetical, I'm gonna turn now to the work of myself and colleagues led by Dr. Angela Helen Martin, who's here in the audience today and gave a uh, uh, different talk on Monday um, that focused on European hake. So this served as a great opportunity to put that corollary that I just showed you to the test. Because between the years of 2008 and 2018, the number of sexually mature adult fish that make up the northern hake stock, that is hake living in the waters of Western Europe, increased by nearly sixfold. And while scientists aren't exactly sure why the standing stock uh, did so well or saw such a dramatic increase, a decrease in fishing pressure likely had something to do with it. 
So this series of events presented us with a prime opportunity um, to test whether or not increasing stock biomass uh, would be associated with decreasing emissions and increased carbon stocks. Uh, while all of this was happening, landings of Hake, perhaps unsurprisingly, also increased. So relevant footprint estimates derived as part of the study include the removal and retention of Hake biomass, uh, total fishery emissions from the fishery, and emission intensity profiles broken down by gear type. Uh, we also included the estimated um, kilometers trawled, which we thought of as a proxy for disruption of uh, sediment carbon. And I'll go ahead and, and uh, show you those results uh, pretty rapid fire now. In terms of the organic carbon available and retained within the adult standing stock, 5.3 million kilograms of organic carbon was contained uh, in 2008 versus 2016, when 34.8 million kilograms of organic carbon was estimated within the standing stock biomass. 96% of adult biomass was landed in 2008 versus in 2016, when only about a third of the standing stock biomass was removed. While emissions of landed fish did increase from 2008 to 2016 by about twofold, we saw a disproportionately high increase of organic carbon retained in the ocean. As I've written here, the amount of organic carbon retained between 2008 and 2016 was over a hundredfold. In terms of emission intensity for one kilogram of fake, we saw a decrease uh, as we expected during this time period um, from 3.12 kilograms of CO2 equivalent to 1.89 kilograms of CO2 equivalent. Emission intensity estimates for each gear type are broken down and listed below the red box here. And if you're interested, uh, all of this work is published uh, in Frontiers in Marine Science. So finally, we have kind of uh, a, a bit of a, an oddball estimate or um, something kind of contrary to what we expected to see. So we have the estimated square kilometers of sediment disturbance due to trawling. Given the increased abundance of hake in 2016 versus 2008, we expected to see less sediment disturbance per kilogram of fish landed, uh, and yet the trawl footprint actually increased from 2008 to 2016. My co-authors and I remain somewhat skeptical of these results, however, um, particularly since the estimated swept area uh, that we calculated using this equation um, is based on the assumption that average trawl door width and average trawl speed remain the same between both years, which is quite a big assumption, but we had to make that assumption due to a lack of data. Additionally, fewer hake were landed in 2016 compared to 2008, and this could create confounding effects in our measurements as well. Um, I did want to point out, however, that, um, you know, we, we ran into a lot of obstacles while, uh, while generating these estimates, and this is for one of the most well-monitored fisheries in the world. So uh, to imagine that we encountered this many obstacles with, with something that is so data-rich, um, I think just, you know, points out the importance of, of future data collecting and development of methodology. So some specific takeaways from this work is that the restoration of North Atlantic Hake um, did create uh, more carbon being held in the ocean and potentially sequestered long term. Although the Hake fishery emits more carbon on net because there are more fish to catch, emissions are significantly less per kilogram of seafood. In other words, organic carbon stocks and fuel efficiency have increased with the restoration of this taxa. General takeaways, um, this should not come as a surprise to anyone, but, but we should definitely work to end overfishing and all the data show this. Uh, you know, overfishing has all sorts of, presents all sorts of socioeconomic problems, ecological problems, and now we have evidence to show that overfishing um, generates more emissions. We should discourage the use of trawl nets whenever possible, as well as other mission intensive fishing gears. So I'm excited uh, to hear the next talk about uh, the effects of trawling. We should account for the role of fisheries and fishing pressure when elucidating or projecting, projecting oceanic carbon flux. And global restoration of wild fish stocks and 
perhaps even cultivation of stocks beyond our normal baseline may serve as a viable strategy for enhancing blue carbon. So with that, I'll close and take time for questions if there are any. I wanna thank you all for listening and thank my co-authors and mentors who helped make this work possible. Thank you very much, Erica, great talk. And uh, I think you make the point very succinctly that uh, greater impact on the ecosystem means higher emissions. Um, and also you raised the point about even how, how, how we struggle to understand even data rich situations. And hopefully that's one of the things that we can begin to uh, address today. Um, there haven't been any specific questions for you, for you in the chat, but there was there was an earlier one that was raised by Rod Wilson, which was asking about the um, the emissions that are likely to be associated um, with uh, mesopelagic fish fisheries. Uh, we we know there's been discussion about um, about this being a fishery resource of the future. Have you got anything um, to say on that? Um, on what what the likely impacts of that is likely to be on? Yeah, emissions? yeah. Yeah, I, I saw that question in the chat and, and, and thought it was interesting. So when I think of like mctophids, for example, there's not a lot of flesh on them. And one of the things that I noticed when generating emission intensity profiles is that a lot of these estimates are incredibly susceptible to the amount of raw meat that you assume you can get out of live weight. So if you are trying to, uh, you know, only extract uh, like, like nice fleshy meat off of mctophids, for example, I imagine the emission intensity profile for those fish would be super high. Um, even if you're, you know, collecting really large schools all at once and you don't have to use trawl nets and so on. Um, if you're grounding, grinding mesopelagic fish down into fish meal, you know, maybe the, the situation changes there. Um, but I think what we see, uh, kind of time and time again is that like we should really fight the urge to move uh deeper into the ocean and more extensively into the ocean and try instead to put our efforts towards managing the fish stocks that you know are close to shore we have good data for we can kind of uh, well manage them thank you very much Erica, a good point well made so Daniele has managed to join us and um and we'll speak next so are you ready, Daniele? I'll just um, give you a brief introduction. Yeah. But Daniele Bianchi is an associate professor uh, at uh, University of California, Los Angeles. His research focuses on the interactions between ocean circulation, chemistry, and marine life, and is based on a combination of observations and numerical models. Specific focuses include the ocean cycles of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, the California current system and global fisheries. And today, Danielle is going to be talking about the global biomass and biogeochemical cycling of marine fish with and without fishing. All right. <laughs> Hopefully you can see my screen and uh, apologies for being a little bit late. So <laughs> I wanna talk about work that we did with uh, Eric Galbraith and David Carossa at uh, McGill University, Jerome Guillet at UCLA and Tim De Vries at Santa Barbara. And it's really a model talk about all the fish in the ocean and how much biogeochemical impact uh, they could uh, have. And so uh, I don't think <laughs> I need much of an introduction on the importance of fish for biogeochemistry. As a few reminder, I think one a very important thing is that they control food webs via top-down interactions. They can also move nutrients and carbon around in the ocean, especially vertical, if you think about the vertical migrations. But also the focus of this talk will be on their ability to produce a fast uh, sinking particle that can reach uh, the deep uh, ocean. And of course, all this biogeochemical role depend on how much fish you have in, in, the, in the ocean, uh, what the, their biomass is, and their uh, metabolic rates and cycling rates. And so for the rest of the talk, my question will be, what is the biomass of fish in the ocean? What is their biogeochemical cycling rate? Uh, and how have these quantities uh, changed uh, over time? Uh, and before I started this work, I wanted to know more or less what the biomass of fish uh, in the ocean is. And so I went into the lit literature and tried to put together a, a, a sort of summary that is by no means um, complete, uh, but I found a lot of different values. And as a reference, you can think of uh, all of uh, humankind being about half a petagram of uh, wet biomass. 
This is the unit that I'm going to use. Um, phytoplankton as a comparison is about 10 uh, petagram, the, li the living stock of all uh, phytoplankton. Uh, fin fish range between one to two petagrams uh, in the literature. Uh, things become a little more complicated if you add mesopelagic fish that themselves range between two and 10, 12 petagrams. So things are a little bit uh, hard to assess there. Uh, then there are some estimates of all marine animals uh, larger than one gram up to five petagram. And finally, some studies talk about all marine consumers and they go up to 50 uh, petagram of uh, biomass. So my take home message here is that there is a large uncertainty in these biomass estimates. They are hard to intercompare. Taxonomy might be different. Methods are all uh, different. And by the way, these are all based on some sort of model uh, synthesis. And many of these studies have a limited comparison with observation, especially when it comes to uh, model. It's very hard to have a widespread global observation of uh, fish and consumers. I think today we're doing much better than when I started this work a few years ago. So our approach is use a global fisheries model. A uh, fish model is part of the fish MIP uh, ensemble of fisheries models. Uh, constrain parameters as much as we can with global observations, and then backtrack uh, with the model, the biomass to a sort of unfished ocean, and then look at the change in biomass and uh, cycling rate. Our model is the boats model. It has been described in few papers. It's part of the fish MIP, uh, fisheries model in intercomparison project ensemble. Uh, and it's a very simple size structure model. It takes two inputs, primary production and um, temperature on a global grid. Um, uh, primary production provides resources for growth, temperature, uh, controls the growth rate and metabolic rates of uh, multiple uh, size, uh, multiple fish group that differ in their uh, size. Uh, fish growing size, so it's a size spectrum model. Uh, they reproduce, so the large fish uh, can produce uh, new recruits. And the model is coupled online with the fishing effort that allow us to uh, calculate the catch and compare that with uh, observations. We use um, global data to try to constrain the model, and uh, we use stock assessments uh, and uh, global catch uh, reconstructions from the Sierra and us project. Stock assessments are good. They are tend to be very accurate, statistically very precise, uh, as much as possible. They include biomass and catches, so two quantities that we are interested in, uh, but they are only existing for selected stocks uh, in limited regions and for limited periods. Uh, CATS data are really a more widespread, they are global, they include multiple species. However, we, we know that CATS is not uh, the same as abundance. There is all the fishing effort uh, and the CATS ability involved. Uh, and there are also accuracy uh, issues. But the nice thing about the CATS is that they are really global and uh, sort of encompassing uh, a lot of different uh, taxonomies. So we try to constrain both with both um, type of data. Uh, and here are results from our uh, simulation after we do all the exercises on cons constraining the model. And I'll show you some comparison with observations. What I'm showing here is cat uh, in million tons per year um, over time. You can think of the zero time here as the peak of the global uh, cat. Uh, these are observations from the Sierra Andas project. So the model does more or less a reasonable job in magnitude, but also in the shape of the increase and maybe the stabilization of the cats. Um, the model also captures spatial patterns uh, in the cats. So on the x-axis here are large marine ecosystem estimates of global cats. On the y-axis, the model, more or less we capture half of the variance of observation from warm to cold ecosystem. So more or less we trust uh, how the model reproduces the cats of fish against observations. Uh, now we want to connect these cats to the biomass. Cats data alone uh, might not be enough to, enough to think about the biomass that is standing uh, in the ocean and support that cat. And so we use cats to biomass ratios from uh, stock assessments that we trust. Uh, this quantity we can calculate for any stock in any large marine ecosystem. And what we did was compare the distribution of cats to biomass ratio, which has unit of uh, one over time. These are uh, all the stocks um, in the RAM um, assessment database, uh, sort of lumped by a uh, large marine ecosystem. Uh, and this is the model ensemble. So uh, the message here is that we have more or less a realistic distribution of this quantity that connects uh, the cats to the biomass. 
And the idea is that now we can use this model also to think a little bit about the uh, biomass uh, in the ocean. We trust it a little more than we did uh, before constraining it. So we have cats, cats to biomass. We can uh, look at the trajectory of biomass of fish in the ocean. Uh, this is on the same uh, time axis. Now the units are uh, gigaton of wet biomass. This is over large marine ecosystem where we trust the model more because the observation come from a large marine ecosystem. Uh, and so we can backtrack the model to the beginning of the simulation in an unfished ocean, very simplified, uh, idealized <laughs> state. And we get a biomass of about 1.5 uh, petagram of uh, fish. Uh, we can also look at the spatial distribution. I'm not going to uh, talk too much about that. The model allows us to extend this biomass over not just the large marine ecosystem, but also the open ocean. And globally, we get about three uh, petagram of uh, biomass. This is for the range um, represented by the model in, in terms of sizes, so 10 grams to 100 kilogram, and for commercial species. But we can uh, estimate also a broader range of sizes and maybe even extrapolate to uh, all the species in, uh, uh, in the ocean with a very rough uh, calculation. So once we do this rescaling um, to a little broader range, we get about five petagram for commercial species. So here is our estimate. Um, we can um, extrapolate to all consumers uh, and we double more or less this biomass. And we can compare these to estimates that actually have the same size range and also encompass more or less all uh, consumers in the ocean. So we are a little bit on the higher range, five to 10 petagram, but we're starting to converge a little bit on this, uh, on this uh, fairly large um, biomass estimate. The model also allows us to estimate how much uh, the metabolism of fish requires them to cycle through biomass, carbon, and other elements. Uh, for all the commercial fish, we get a cycling rate of about 10 petagram of wet biomass per year. If you want to know the number in terms of carbon, you divide that by 10, so maybe one petagram of carbon per year. Uh, again, we can compare that to biogeochemically relevant quantities. So we compare that with primary production, and we get that potentially fish cycle through maybe 1% to 2% globally of primary production with a lot of specially different patterns. If a region is more productive, food web tends to be a little shorter, uh, phytoplankton is larger, so fish might be able to cycle through more of this uh, primary production. You can see that in upwelling system and high uh, latitudes. Uh, and of course, the question for the last few minutes will be, what is the importance for uh, biogeochemistry? And this is a very hard question. So we try to break it down into the, the, the simplest uh, aspect that we could study in a more reliable way. And we focus on the production of fast uh, sinking fecal pellets. We get that fish in our model more or less produce about 2% uh, percent or so of the particles sinking out of the euphotic zone. If we calculate the ingestion by uh, fish, this is about 0 0.2, pe 0.2 petagram of carbon per year. The important thing is that as we learn even from, uh, from um, Grace uh, papers, uh, fish produce fecal pellet are uh, sink very fast, even kilometers uh, in a day. And so they can reach the deep ocean uh, relatively uh, without being uh, remineralized uh, completely. Uh, and to give you an example, this is a typical profile of uh, particle, all the particles, all the aggregates, attenuation with depth. Fecal pellets would almost be a straight line. They would reach a few kilometers depth without being consumed. So if at the surface they are maybe 1% or 2% of the total particles in the deep ocean, they can be a tenth of the particles surviving there. And so we estimate this effect uh, by um, taking this export by fish and all the other particles and running an ocean circulation inverse model that tells us more or less where the products of remineralization distribute in terms of carbon, uh, oxygen consumption, and so forth. And we run that at steady state with and without um, fish uh, produced uh, fecal pellets. To give you an example, so we, we, we run the model with uh, fish fecal pellets sinking about 10 times faster, uh, and we find that they are responsible for about 10% of all the uh, oxygen utilization in the deep ocean. And this is quite similar to what Jessica was showing uh, on Monday, uh, thinking about uh, salp and fish uh, fecal pellets. This is a, this is a global uh, section average uh, across uh, latitudes of the fractional oxygen utilization that can be attributed to the fish produce fecal pellets. And so about 10% uh, 
of all the respiration in the deep ocean uh, can be attributed to do those particles that sink um, deeper uh, that in our models are produced by fish. And this, re this corresponds to about 100 uh, petagram of carbon permanently, well, or sequestered for hundreds of years in the deep ocean, about 10% of the biological uh, pump uh, carbon sequestration in the deep uh, ocean. Uh, and of course, there have been impacts uh, on uh, fish biomass. Yes, change over time. Our model predicts uh, that from about uh, 1.5 petagram um, of biomass in large marine ecosystem, it went down um, at peak harvest uh, to about 30% uh, uh, or so. Maybe this is a little bit of an overestimate. I would say maybe half of the uh, biomass um, has been uh, consumed at the peak. And so we can imagine that um, this bio, remaining biomass uh, cannot cycle through as much as the pristine biomass. So if you look at our paper, we have some estimates of how the biomass has been reduced. The cycling rate has been reduced as well, uh, anywhere between 50% and 10% uh, or so. In the model, productive regions are depleted first. This is sort of a fishing dynamics. You first go where the fish are more abundant uh, and more, less productive regions are depleted um, later. And of course, there are biogeochemical consequences that we did not estimate with our model. But uh, if we know that today fish are responsible for something like 10% of the deep carbon sequestration, we can think that if you have the total uh, biogeochemical cycling rate, you might have all sort of repercussion on uh, biogeochemical cycles of carbon, oxygen, and nutrients. And these numbers are not negligible. A few percent changes are comparable to the effect of uh, global warming. So we argue that we should consider uh, the effect of fisheries on uh, global biogeochemistry as well. I'm going to wrap up quickly. So uh, we had a data constraint model uh, we get estimates of the global biomass. I think these are still very uncertain. I would love to see uh, more, more models applying sort of similar methods. We estimated the cycling rate uh, at about 10 petagram per year of biomass by commercial fish, 1% to 2% of primary production and export. But the fecal pellets are fast, so they can consume um, oxygen and release carbon in the deep ocean at about 10% of the total uh, biological pump sequestration. Um, this has been reduced by the global fisheries. We don't know the consequences of that. Uh, there are obviously signature in biogeochemistry that we should start looking for, uh, but I think it's very complex to, to assess. There are trophic cascades that complicate uh, the situation. Our model does not represent very well these trophic cascades, so we could not uh, go into the details. And there are a lot of either stabilizing feedbacks, but potentially even tipping points. So it's a hard <laughs> problem to do. I would say that the way forward is uh, having better and better observations, but also using multiple models. Our model is very simple. Uh, there are models that are being integrated with earth system models used to study carbon and nutrient cycle. I, I, I argue that fish, or we argue that fish should be an integral part of these earth system models going forward. And we should consider the reduction caused by uh, fishing. Um, there are many impacts that we did not consider and that we heard about in this in previous talk or in the next talk, bottom trolling, habitat degradation, mesopelagic fisheries, we did not include them. They are minor today, but they have potential to really change uh, the biogeochemistry of the deep ocean. Problems like bycatches and carcasses and uh, uh, calcium carbonate cycling. So I'm going to stop here. <laughs> Hopefully timing was right and uh, look forward for the next talks uh, as well. Thank you very much, Danielle. A great talk. Uh, it's, it just goes to show what an amazing range of parameters you can estimate from these sort of global models. I'm not going to ask any questions now. Um, I've, I've, I've added mine to the chat and I'd ask you to just um, engage with the chat. And what we found in previous talks is people have, have actually been asking questions after the talk. So if, if you'd engage with that and then we can move on with, with uh, Lucas. Uh, and hopefully not eat too much into the time available for the lightning talks. Thank you very much, Danielle. So our next speaker is Lucas Pors, who is a postdoctoral researcher in the Sediment Transport and Morphodynamics Group at the Helmholtz Centrum Herion in Germany. Uh, I'm just, yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, he completed his PhD at the University of Hamburg, where, he's, where he researched the morphodynamics of shelf mud depot centers. He's currently working on numerical modeling of human impacts on sedimentary carbon 
sequestration. And he's going to talk to us today about the impact of bottom trawling on long-term carbon sequestration in shelf sea sediments. Thank you very much, Lucas. Yes, thank you, Simeon. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to share with you today um, the results of an ongoing project where um, we are trying to quantify the amount of uh, organic carbon which is being affected by um, human impacts, uh, specifically in the North Sea. And uh, we decided very early on in the project that uh, yeah, bottom trawling is probably the primary thing we should uh, focus on. And uh, this is what we started with. And um, yeah, many colleagues have uh, contributed to this study, which you can see down here from uh, various institutions. So um, yeah, so as a bit of uh, motivation, maybe I think we've seen this, this type of uh, figure several times uh, on Monday and today. So um, this is from an older IPCC report, but I still like to show it. It's showing the um, reservoirs or the pools and fluxes of, uh, of carbon in the earth system. And so what I'm uh, focusing on today is not the living stocks that we heard so much uh, about, but uh, the um, ocean floor sediments and uh, as Emma mentioned earlier it's um, it's kind of special because it's not only a, a giant carbon reservoir but uh, it's only if we think about it yeah sedimentation is the only real permanent carbon sink that we have in the system so permanent meaning on time scales of uh, more than hundreds of years so uh, it might be nice to know whether and to which degree we are um, affecting this or, or messing with this somehow. Yeah, so how is bottom trawling affecting carbon sequestration? So I've tried to sketch here the, the processes which uh, I think are most important or which we think are, are the major ones. So um, it's uh, first of all, resuspension. I think this is what most people think of when they uh, think about trawling impacts on, on carbon sequestration is the resuspension of carbon in the sediment and then it can get re-exposed to oxygen and remineralized and release CO2 in this way. Um, but I think there are many other processes which are often neglected. And uh, so first of all, the transport. So when that is resuspended, um, most of it will not remineralize immediately. Most of it will just sink back down because it is maybe refractory and uh, not bioavailable. Or if there are currents that can get transported to maybe deeper areas, which might even be more conducive to burial. Um, so uh, this is something that I think uh, many studies have not considered. And um, then we have, of course, the interaction with the benthos, so the animals living on and in the seabed, uh, which are also consuming uh, some of the carbon and uh, they are respirating and so on. And uh, some of this this benthos will get killed or, or depleted when, when there's trawling. So typically something like 10 to 20% will not survive a pass by a trawler. And so if we are depleting the benthos, then it cannot uh, as efficiently uh, bury and uh, mix into its thing in the sediment. Um, finally, what we also have is a, a physical mixing effect by the trawling gear itself. So the penetrating components of these trawlers are basically churning the um, the sea floors are similar to a plow on a field. And um, yeah, this is also, I think, a, a difficult thing to estimate. So what is the effect of this on, on the um, carbon uh, cycling? And there are also some other effects which, uh, which I cannot go into here. So something like a resuspension of nutrients, which in shallow areas might uh, increase primary production and so on. Um, these are kind of higher order effects, which, uh, which we are also looking into. But um, right now, I want to focus on these uh, effects, which I have just discussed, uh, which I think or we think are most, most uh, direct and most important. So if we look at um, bottom trawling globally, where is it occurring? And we can see it's occurring almost on all, all shelves globally um, in some areas more than in others. And uh, what I or the area that we focused on, because we know it, very well is the North Sea, and uh, it ha also happens to be uh, one of the most intensely trawled, um, so historically, very intensely trawled uh, areas uh, globally. Um, so this is what we see here on the right. This is a sediment map, which I show here of the North Sea, and uh, we can see that, uh, so this is the mud content actually. And uh, so 
most of the of the North Sea is quite shallow, so less than 100 meters depth and um, quite sandy. So there is not really sediment being deposited there, uh, not a lot of carbon, but there are some hotspots of deposition. So these brownish areas here, these are topographic depressions. So the Norwegian Trench, uh, south of Norway and an area called Flood and Ground in the north there, and some other smaller patches where, uh, where sediment is accumulating and the carbon content is a little bit higher. Uh, so this is what we see here on the in the left map. This is the carbon content in the sediment, and uh, we can see it follows more or less the the mud content. So the areas where there's high mud content are also the areas where carbon. Uh, so these are carbon depot centers basically. So what I show here on the right is the um, the swept area ratio. So this is a measure of how intensely these areas have been trawled. So uh, the way to read this is that. Um, for example, if, if a pixel has a value of 10, then uh, this pixel has been touched on average or has been contacted by bottom trawling here 10 times per year. So uh, if we compare these two maps here, we can already guess that where well, there are some areas this, uh, which have a high carbon content, which are intensely trawled and where we can expect really some, some uh, large impacts. So especially in the uh, in the Norwegian Trench and um, Skagerrak up here, north of, uh, of Denmark. So the way with that we try to bring these two things together, so the trawling impacts and the carbon is uh, through um, a numerical model. So we use a, a 3 decoupled um, numerical coastal ocean model uh, where we have uh, the hydrodynamics um, or hydrodynamic module, which is taking care of the currents and the transport of suspended sediment and so on. We have an ecosystem model, which is telling us how much uh, detritus, so how much dead organic material is reaching the seafloor. So um, including the, the pellets that, uh, that Daniela um, talked about. And we also have a benthos model, which is uh, resolving the, the action of the, the benthic animals, which are yeah, um, mixing the and consuming the carbon in the sea floor, so we resolve that in a, in a 1D vertical um, model as well. And uh, so then what we do is we, we add these trawling impacts on top of that. So we add the trawling resuspension and um, the trawling uh, mortality from um, so from the trawl passes and then some amount of the benthos will, uh, will die off. And what, um, or what we thought is important to consider here is that different trawl types have different seafloor impacts. So um, depending on what type of, uh, of fish or what type of uh, yeah, animal you're targeting with your fishing, um, you will use different, different gear types, different combinations of gear components. And uh, these are just uh, four examples that I show here, uh, two beam trawl uh, metiers and two otter trawl metiers. And for example, in the top left, these are basically the, the, uh, the shrimp, shrimp fishing, and mostly in the, of the German um, or near the German coast. And in the bottom right, we have uh, otter trawls targeting um, demersal fish, which are, as we can see, more widespread. And uh, you may imagine that, um, for example, a, a trawl dwarf, such an otter, otter trawler, will have a much larger impact per area contacted. Than, uh, for example, a rope or uh, or a headline of of a beam trawler. Um, so this is something we have to consider. And uh, one way we consider this is through different uh, resuspension rates. And we use here um, a very simple numeric or let's say uh, empirical formula, where uh, the resuspension rate depends only on two things. So the first is the silt fraction of the sediment. So basically. The muddier the sediment, the higher the resuspension controlling will be. And secondly, the hydrodynamic drag of um, the gear component. So that means, again, the, the otter trawl will have, uh, or otter trawl doors will have a higher hydrodynamic dynamic drag than a rope or a net, for example. Um, and then we, we apply this to um, uh, the, these different metiers that I showed earlier, and we co locate. Uh, the vessel positions from the Global Fishing Watch database, which uh, many of you are aware of. So this is a database of, um, of daily fishing effort. And um, th in this way, we can make uh, forcings for our, for our model. And this, this uh, estimation includes 
includes the gear types that I showed earlier, different gear com components, the vessel speeds, vessel side or en size or engine power, and um, as I said here, the mud content of the sediment as well. And so the result of that is uh, what we see here on the right. So uh, this uh, figure in the middle shows the natural resuspension rate, so averaged over um, a few years. Um, so carbon resuspension rate just from kind of tides and, and uh, wind-driven currents. And um, on the right, we have the trawling resuspension, which is, as we can see, so this color bar here is logarithmic. So we have really some orders of magnitude higher uh, resuspension from trawling in, in some areas, especially these heavily trawled and muddy areas, which are almost never resuspended uh, naturally, which is why they are accumulation areas. So this means in these areas, it's really the trawling that's responsible for most of the um, carbon and, and sediment fluxes. Okay, so what is the, the impact of this on the sedimentary carbon? So this is basically the main result here. And um, what I show here on the left in this map is, uh, so we did two, um, two experiments, one with trawling and uh, one without trawling. And here we, so, uh, we show the difference. So there are some areas which are red and some which are blue. So red here means that trawling causes a loss of, uh, of net carbon in the sediment. And blue means that carbon is increased. So why is there some increase in some areas? It's because of this transport of the material that is resuspended and can deposit in deeper areas. So especially in this trench here, but also in some other areas which are, which are less trawled. And um, so the net effect that we have here on the carbon is that about 1 million tons per year um, of CO2 equivalent is lost or is, let's say, buried uh, less than due to bottom trawling. So we see this in the long-term simulations that we did. This is from 1975 to 2015. And what is shown here is the total carbon stock, so the total organic carbon stock in the sediment. And um, so these lines, the, the green one is uh, the kind of reference run without any trawling at all, so only a kind of natural sedimentation. And the stock is going up and up. And uh, yeah, this is what we like to see. This is the natural carbon sequestration capacity of the system. And then if we add trawling, um, then it's becoming less and less. And uh, so as we go down, down here, we increase the trawling pressure, so meaning that uh, um, the uh, mortality of the of the benthos is increasing due to trawling. Um, as we go down here, until um, if we really have a high trawling pressure, it's uh, the carbon content or the carbon budget is almost stagnating here. So there's almost no more, um, or the, the North Sea does not act as a carbon sink anymore in that case. Um, so looking at a uh, similar uh, thing as for the carbon, but this time for macrobenthos biomass. And uh, on the left here in the top, we see the um, distribution of macrobenthos biomass, which is more or less following the carbon dis distribution. So where there's more carbon, more food, um, macrobenthos can, can grow faster and better. And uh, on the right, we see the depletion of this um, macrobenthos due to trawling. And uh, so the, the purple values mean that macrobenthos is depleted. And in some areas, it's also increasing a little bit due to this transporting effect, but that's very minor. So um, in total, we have a, a decrease of uh, something like 15% or so in our model. And uh, so over time, we see it here. But by the way, this, uh, this uh, wiggling is the seasonal effect that we see. And uh, we also added here two. Uh, and these diamonds, these purple diamonds, are from two um, ICES surveys, which try to estimate the total um, biomass as well. And uh, we can see that they are close to our to this blue line, which uh, is some indication for us that um, yeah, that trawling is actually necessary to get a, a, a more realistic uh, biomass. So uh, we are kind of happy with this, but it also indicates that. Perhaps our lower impact scenario is, is the more realistic one since it's closer to the what has been measured. What we can also see here is that in the um, past uh, 10 or 15 years, um, these uh, or the biomass has converged a little bit. And this is because um, 
bottom trawling effort has also reduced significantly in the last 20 years in the North Sea. And so we capture this, uh, this effect as well. Okay, so now we can talk maybe a little bit about um, yeah, implications for management. So what I show here on the left is uh, again, the, the trawling effort in the colors. And these gray areas here are the different um, proposed or planned um, marine protected areas, which are most of them or the vast majority is not in any way enforced, uh, or it's only beginning to be um, enforced now. So that's why there's still a lot of overlap. There are no real areas where uh, trawling is prohibited yet. And um, yeah, if we compare that to again, our sediment map, which we see on the right. So this is the, again, the carbon density again, and we can see that most of this area, which is planned to be protected is not really rich in carbon. So um, now we can begin to maybe speculate what will happen if, if these areas are closed for trawling. So we can assume that maybe the, Fishing won't just stop, but it will move to other areas, maybe adjacent areas where the carbon will be um, or might be carbon content might be higher. And so that means that this effort might, in fact, increase the carbon emission from the sediment due to trawling. Um, so, yeah, this is something we could discuss, but uh, we are also preparing some simulations to, um, to find out whether this is really the case. And um, yeah, to summarize, uh, according to our model, bottom trawling decreases the North Sea's capacity for carbon storage by about 30%, um, so to about 70% of its natural capacity, which is equivalent to about um, 1 million tons of CO2. Um, and notably, this is, uh, although it's not such a low number, but it's um, significantly less than what has been uh, estimated before. Um, the we find the strongest impacts in muddy areas with a high organic carbon content, whereas sandy areas are not so, so much affected. Macrobenthos biomass is reduced by uh, around 15%. And uh, we can speculate whether the current uh, spatial plans, which do not consider carbon benefits, um, would even lead to a, an increased uh, carbon loss from the seabed. Um, yeah, so thank you for listening. Um, I hope there's some time for questions left. And uh, otherwise, um, if you're interested in this, we, uh, we have a preprint which we uploaded, which uh, you can read. And um, yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks a lot, Lucas. Um, I, I think we are a bit over time. So I'm just going to thank Lucas and the other three speakers for, uh, um, for, for very interesting, stimulating talks. Um, Lucas, please do engage with the the um, the chat where Svenja at least has already asked a question. I imagine some more people will come along and ask questions soon. But now we'll try and move into the lightning talks session. So I'm going to hand over to Emma, who's going to introduce that. Yes, thank you. And yeah, thanks so much. They were fascinating um, plenary talks. So we now have four lightning talks. So these talks are three slides and three minutes. Um, so for um, the audience, please ask questions to the Lightning Talk speakers in the chat as well. We won't be coming to kind of live questions um, just for time. So maybe you could share the first slide, which is um, Tebow, and then, um, yeah, I'll, I'll time you and shout if you're way over three minutes, but otherwise take it, take it away. All right, thank you. Hope you can hear me. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Thibaut Cariou. I'm a postdoc at the Marine Institute in Ireland. And so my work uh, focuses on spatial temporal variance in mesopelagic fish distribution uh, in Western Ireland using acoustic surveys. And today I will be representing Dave Reed, uh, not to present a study, but to present a new project called Ocean ICU improving carbon understanding. And for those, for those wondering, yes, the pun is intended. So the project is very new. It's a European funded project for four years. Um, the kick off meeting was in February, 2023. And so the broad objectives are to measure and model ocean carbon sinks and 
today I'm presenting one of the work packages dedicated to uh, the impact on fisheries especially and I'm also mentioning here because I saw it in the chat earlier there's a, a part on deep sea mining as well in these work packages next slide please thank you so the work packages has two uh, main elements off and on the shelf so off the shelf uh, we will focus on mesopelagic and large epipelagic fish and modeling population dynamics using two models, Feisty and Cipoli. And so here it's mainly the loss of carbon sequestration through um, the removal of biomass. And the part on the shelf, it's more about the mussel fishing. And so here there's a few models involved, Ecopath, Rubicosim, Ecotroph, which are uh, food webs model and strath e to e which is a semi-spatial broad brush end-to-end -end model uh, but it's based on nitrogen so here the main main trick is to convert that uh, to carbon link with stoichiometry and there's also the problematic of resuspension of sediment from fishing which we saw in the previous talks and so that will be a part handled with pml and nios and Next slide, please. Just a couple of things I want to mention around uh, ocean ICU. So related to the mesopelagic fish, uh, we're also working on the meso project. Uh, we saw on Monday that uh, the understanding the biomass was important for the carbon flux. And so we've been working on that, especially with one species, Morolicus. And just a shout out to a coming workshop uh, WK Fish Carbon, which is taking place at the 25th to 28th of April. Registration is until the 11th of April, and it will be co-chaired by Dave and Emma. That's it for me. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, great. So, yes, yeah, so if there are any questions for T-Bolt, then head to the chat. And now we'll have Billy Christensen. Indeed, here I am. Um, I work with development of the EWE ecosystem modeling framework. And if you don't know about it, it's a widely used food web modeling system. We're talking about more than a thousand journal publications uh, using this approach. And based on that, we actually have a lot of knowledge about standing stocks and flows in ecosystems. I mainly work with Marta Kahl and June Steinbeck on a number of issues such as uh, EWE development. And there's also a lot of work that we do that go into a global ecosystem model called EcoOcean, which I'll talk a little bit about in the last slide. Of relevance for this uh, workshop here is that we're currently working on developing an emulator for the World Bank that is intended to evaluate carbon sequestration of development bank projects. So in kind of what we would like to do is to get the results from this workshop and all the accumulated knowledge and use that to develop a tool. You may say that's a tall order, but these development bank projects are not going to wait another 10 years for more research to be done. We have to do and work with what we know now. So that will be the first version of that tool. There'll be more coming. Um, next, please. One thing that I wanted to talk about here is also a study we did a few years ago where we tried to evaluate the fish biomass changes in the ocean. Before that, we didn't use a global ocean model, but we took 230 snapshots of ecosystem models and we specialized them, we ran more time, we distributed them, and then we uh, came up with um, multiple regression to evaluate time trends and distributions. And uh, you can see from this that we had quite a lot of models going back to the early parts of the 20th century. And in total, as mentioned, more than 230 models. The, uh, if we look at the outcome from that, that means what is the impact of fisheries over this century? We see that the initial period there, 1910 to 1970, which was an early development for global fisheries, 
there was a slight decrease in the predatory fish, and predatory fish are fish with uh, trophic levels about 3.5. And the major development happened there in the 70s and 80s up to the early 90s, and we saw a large decrease in predatory fish during that time, and then the leveling off in the period up to 2010. If we project this, I would be pretty certain that we're going to see a leveling off as well. And uh, in some areas, we will even see decrease increases in, in predatory fish biomass. Now we also looked at the um, we also looked at the low traffic level productive fish. And while predatory fish decreased 75%, we found that prey fish increased with 130%. Uh, percent. So it indicates prey release and it also indicates that uh, these are indicators of some traffic cascading as well. So this is something that this data, these snapshots indicate happened. And the last one, please. We are doing similar things to this with a global ecosystem model called Echo Ocean. It's one of the core models in the HMIP fish map, just like the boats that Danielle was talking about, but a very different approach to it. It's, uh, it's under active development. We have a number of applications, several EU projects, and we're also seeing similar impacts here that under climate change, large species tend to decline, under climate change of fisheries, and small fisheries, small species may be increasing. We are also seeing at the global level indications of many, many areas see a reversal that fisheries are improving. Now, that brings us back to what uh, maybe back to uh, what we want to do for this emulator for the World Bank. Um, the key question we're asking there is what proportion of which ecosystem flows are likely to be sequestered? So we're putting up a, a big food web skits, uh, sketch and then trying to see for all the different parts of it, can we come to consensus about how much of these flows are going to be sequestered and these flows and these flows and so on. That's the intention with this. Yes, it is a, it's a daunting task. It calls for taking a global model, uh, subjecting it to various pressures, and then looking at what the impact will be and doing thousands and thousands and thousands of runs. But that is feasible. So we can use global models to come up with global estimates for what our impacts and we may, we are even taking the challenge of doing it regionally in context with these development bank projects. And I'm very happy to uh, work with many people on, on this and uh, encourage uh, cooperation. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. So, yeah, any questions for um, Billy in the chat? So we'll move straight on to Rick Stafford. Hi there. Yeah, thanks. Um, so. I'm a, a professor of marine ecology at Bournemouth University in the UK. Um, I'm going to go through a few different bits in these slides. And I'm going to start off, off sort of talking about carbon budgets and open and closed systems. So this paper um, not, hasn't really got anything to do with fission carbon, but it does think about open and closed uh, systems. And that's led to this idea of event carbon budgets, which I put in as simple maths as, as I'm going to understand here. And to think about this in a slightly different way, um, fundamentally, most uh, photosynthesis, most primary productivity in the ocean is respired somewhere near the surface. Um, so there's two things we can kind of look at, and that's what's respired deeper down and sequestered, or we could look at, um, you know, at how we maximise that, or we could look at how we minimise things like respiration, which is going to be the point really of, of this talk. Uh, so can I have the next slide? Um, so we did some work based on a uh, on Chinese uh, fisheries, uh, partly because we had data for this, um, and this follows on from the uh, previous talk. And, you know, again, what we found is is that there was prey release. In fact, that was in the previous paper. Um, so what that means is, as we fish out some of the top predators, we end up with more smaller um, pelagic fish. Now. While the overall biomass of the ocean probably goes down as a result of fishing out those predators, the smaller um, fish are much, much more productive. Um, so overall, just thinking about fish, and I'll come to zooplankton and phytoplankton later, what that means is they're breathing more, they're producing more carbon dioxide up 
very often in surface waters. So the amount of um, carbon which is available to be pulled down to deep ocean or sequestered actually goes down. Now, the best evidence we have, and I don't believe this for a second, is that the phytoplankton and zooplankton are more based on a bottom-up process and the top predators down to the planktivores are more based on a top-down process and zooplankton may not be affected. As I say, I don't really believe that myself, but it is a big knowledge gap which we've got. Um, can we go to the next slide? Um, so we did some calculations. Um, so basically what that means is the respiration change in fish alone, so the amount of increased respiration as a result of fishing, um, probably, uh, well, at least within this Chinese system, um, if we scale that up around the world, would be about 50% of the carbon produced by the aviation industry. And linking back to talks around, um, linking back to talks around sort of uh, carbon being released from the sediments due to trawling, there are some estimates that that's another 50%. So fishing could be having an effect of, of that, the whole of the aviation industry in terms, of, uh, in terms of essentially the carbon which has ended up in the atmosphere. Now, that's probably not true in terms of this data because what happens to the plankton, which is extremely productive, is going to be absolutely key. And we don't really have good data on that at the moment. Um, so it's one of, the, one of the shortcomings, things we'd like to address, and we've got some ideas around this, which could include uh, models like EcoPath, um, could include uh, um, looking at eDNA, um, so basically seeing what happens in terms of relative abundance of plankton and relative abundance of fish as things change over time. Um, and it could involve looking at uh, sediment cores, assuming they haven't been disturbed by fishing. Okay, thanks. Awesome, thank you so much, Rick. And our final lightning talk is from Mary. Thank you, Emma. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Mary Wise. I'm a professor uh, at the World Maritime University in Malmo, Sweden. And uh, I am uh, speaking today on behalf of the Ocean ICU uh, Consortium to introduce uh, some of the applications questions that we're going to address in this project. And uh, uh, we heard a, a nice presentation earlier uh, at the beginning of the lightning talks uh, from about, about uh, uh, the modeling tools that we are using in the project. Uh, but the, the project is uh, called uh, Improving Carbon Understanding for a Healthy and Resilient Ocean and Sustainable Blue Economy. It's Horizon, 20, uh, it's a Horizon Europe project with, uh, with, with, with over 20 different partners. And again, uh, um, uh, this uh, uh, presentation is, um, uh, is, is speaking about some of the applications that, that we're interested in uh, in looking at link to the work package eight connecting uh, uh, ocean ICU to society, and this is a a uh, work package that I'm co-leading with uh, Debbie Padreshi, who is in the uh, session today, and also Kate Larkin from uh, Seascape Belgium. So next slide, please. So see, here are some of the uh, aims, sorry, with over 30 partners that we have in this uh, consortium. But uh, some of the aims that we have uh, in this uh, 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 project are to improve our understanding of the biological carbon pump now and also into the future with climate change and also changes in human activities, including potential changes to fisheries. Uh, we are also interested to quantify and model the key processes that could be affected by, uh, by, by protection, such as the, uh, the biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction uh, treaty that, uh, that we learned about this weekend. We are also interested uh, to learn about the potential of, of restoring uh, fish populations uh, and also potential habitats, uh, in, and also uh, looking at trajectories of industry, possibly even geoengineering, even things like carbon markets and how these could all affect the carbon cycle. Uh, we are also having a, a focus in our work package on uh, area-based management scenarios, the development of these, and also look 
looking at the valuation of ocean carbon services, because if we have, we could strengthen uh, the valuation of ocean carbon services, then this could potentially influence uh, the way that we prioritize um, the management and the government governance of, of, of certain human activities and looking at different kinds of of interventions. Uh, we're also developing decision support tools to inform policy, uh, negotiations, management, also potential investment from different uh, from different sectors. And uh, next slide, please. The last slide, and this is uh, just a plug. Uh, this uh, is something that uh, uh, Debbie Padreshi uh, from the Marine Institute of Ireland will also present uh, tomorrow. And this is, we are trying to recruit uh, uh, the identities of, of potential stakeholders who, who uh, would, would be able to provide input to the Ocean ICU project. So these are stakeholders who have an interest in climate, fisheries, marine extraction, the areas beyond national jurisdiction, uh, uh, marine protected areas, uh, and also marine policy. And so these are um, stakeholders could be high level decision makers. These are leaders from industry. So if you could please um, uh, have a look uh, at this, um, uh, at, at our stakeholder interests, and if you could possibly suggest some, that would be very, very helpful for us because we'd like to harvest the input from, from different stakeholders in order to develop scenarios to, uh, to and also the, the development of our decision support tools. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mary. And thank you to all the, the Lightly Talk speakers. We really appreciate um, getting that additional input. And if anybody has questions for any of them, please do put them in the chat. But we'll now stop for a break. We're a bit um, over time. I apologise for that. So the idea is we'll still give you uh, just over 10 minutes. So if you could come back at 10 to the hour, um, whatever that hour is for you. So we'll basically have a 12 minute break and see you back at 10 to where we'll go into discussions and can have lots more chat amongst everyone. So thanks and see you at 10 to. Welcome back everyone. I hope you had a good break. So now we're going to go into the interactive discussion part of today's session. Um, as I mentioned in the introduction, we have um, three questions that we'd like you to address. Now we're going to be using this Jamboard format. Um, some of you may not be familiar with it. Um, I think it's probably worth just uh, um, uh, praising you of, a, of an issue we encountered um, on Monday's, Monday's session, which is that some people don't have access to Google products. So if you find yourself in a, meet, in a session uh, with somebody who doesn't have access to um, Google products and therefore can't use the Jamboards, could you pop out of, or could one of you pop out of your session and we'll see if we can give you screen sharing privileges so you can so they can at least see what's going on. So Jamboards basically allow you to answer questions in a, a variety of ways. Um, the, the main method we'll be using is this creation of sticky notes. So if you can see my um, cursor, you can see that there's a, a variety of tools here that we can create sticky notes with. Um, the first question asks you to do two things. The first thing is to identify the key knowledge gaps on how fishing might improve the, um, sorry, how fishing might impact the ocean carbon cycle. We've, we've seeded the exercise with a few suggestions here. Please could you discuss amongst yourselves whether you agree that these are key knowledge gaps and whether you can identify others. Um, and if you want to delete some of ours, that's perfectly acceptable. If you want to add others, that's also acceptable. But then the idea of this exercise, once you've identified these knowledge gaps, is to arrange them on these two axes to create this quadrant plot, which tells us the relationship between how important a knowledge gap is and how feasible it is to address. And by feasible, we mean um, how, how easy it will be to make substantial progress within the next five years. Um, by importance, that may be a bit subjective. Um, it's kind of up to you to decide what actually constitutes importance. But I guess what we're talking about is, is going to be within the realm of scientific importance for, for improving our understanding in this field. So the other thing we'd like you to do with this first screen is add the names of the group members um, so that we can see who's contributing to this. Um, 
And it's probably useful to nominate within your group a, a note taker who's responsible for distilling the conversation and, and placing it um, in these um, sticky notes. So just to um, be clear, you can actually drag these sticky notes around to place them where you like on these two axes. Um, the next question is a fairly simple um, ask to provide um, information. So it's identify available tools and data for filling the knowledge gaps identified in the first question. So the idea is that these tools and data already exist and could move us forward in our understanding. We've created three categories in which you might like to, um, well, to categorize your answers, which is experiments, observations, and models. So once again, if you have an idea, just produce a sticky note here, um, place it, um, so use this tool to produce sticky note, write on um, an appropriate answer to the question and place it where you like in this grid. If it doesn't fall easily into one of these three categories, then you can stick it under uh, in, the, in the section uh, marked other. And then the final question is, how could fisheries management help to limit the impacts of fishing on the ocean carbon cycle? So the idea here really is, again, you populate this, this white space with sticky notes, but it might be appropriate if those sticky notes arise from discussions within your group and can sort of summarize um, the conclusions that you reach in your discussions. Um, I hope those uh, instructions were reasonably straightforward. We'll provide some feedback or some instant reporting on this, especially in, in terms of uh, this um, quadrant plot that you're going to produce in the first exercise at the end of this session. But the boards will remain open until um, the, end of, um, the end of this workshop, that is um, until at least the end of tomorrow, if you want to sort of come back and re-engage with this exercise after we close today. Um, the other thing to point out is that because we uh, were running five minutes late in the last session, we're going to extend the time of it. Well, we're going to uh, change the timings of everything in um, from the originally advertised to be uh, five minutes later. So this um, exercise um, will run, I think, until um, whatever the next hour is. Uh, 40 minutes past the next hour, is this correct? Somebody could jump in and- Yeah, yeah, 40 minutes yeah. past. So you have 45 minutes to um, in your discussion groups, in your breakout rooms. Yeah. So um, Heather has created some breakout rooms and will um, assign us to them so we can engage with this exercise. Welcome back. Everyone, yeah, uh, as Emma mentioned, we had a sudden transition being rapidly transported back to uh, back to Kansas there. Um, so I know for a fact that Anel was making a very interesting point in our session, uh, but we can we can talk about that later. Um, uh, so the, the idea now was that we were going to just briefly look at some of the results, um, especially in the, the quadrant plot, the quadrant plots. Um, and um, and then uh, Emma is going to wrap up. So I can display the quadrant plot from um, the group I was involved in. I think I may need Heather to show me some others. In fact, Heather, if, if you're prepared to drive this and share your screen, could you show the, the group four one to start with? Thank you very much. So. So yeah, the, um, the purpose of this exercise was to sort of try and identify um, important knowledge gaps and sort of um, compare them in terms of both how important they were and how feasible they are. Uh, so one of the things that happened within our group, there was quite a lot of discussion around the, 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 the seeding notes that Emma and I had provided and then quite a lot of unpacking of those phrases. And some of them we felt sort of still needed further unpacking, even, even after we'd, um, we'd written, we'd, bro we'd broken them down into, um, into sort of child notes. But um, one of the clear things was that almost everything was important. Some people with knowledge of the Sea Around Us database um, felt that, you know, maybe discards isn't such a, so important 
uh, when compared to the other ways in which um, fisheries may impact the carbon cycle. So, so this causes the solitary um, uh, entry there. That's that's kind of uh, in the in the in the, the the half of the graph that that is less important. Um, but then there did seem to be. Um, some sort of uh, discrimination of of all of those important things into those that are feasible and those that are less feasible in in the next five years. So the less feasible uh, ones included um, estimation of wild bi biomass, and that includes pristine biomass, which obviously is massively uncertain. Um, quantification and effects of fish movement. Uh, and then what originally started off as, as trophic cascades, but was split down into bottom up and, and, and top down effects. All of those seem like they're, they're you know, they may need quite a bit more work. But then positively, um, we felt that uh, we can provide significant progress on a whole bunch of other stuff, including carbon emissions from, um, from fuel, the effects of benthic trawling, estimates of total catch. Um, uh, and some um, some stuff on on the fish physiology and the forms of carbon that they produce. Um, I, I think the this is deliberate that the habitat so basically apportioning those um, processes that um, fish contribute to the carbon cycle into different habitats is I think deliberately straddling the uh, the line between in, important and less important. Um, I can't really comment on on why it's there as, as recognized as feasible, but it does seem that people people felt it is feasible. If we look quickly at another one, I guess the key question is, is it very, very different? So Heather, would you just like to show us uh, one from another group? Okay, so we have a few more things occupying the um, the um, less important half of the graph. Um, and we have some unpacking and addition of new things going on, um, slightly less than in our group. And uh, yeah, so I think there's a similarity there that trophic cascades was recognized important, but but um, less feasible. And that um, benthic trawling is something that is important and feasible. Um, and I see we've got uh, biomass removal broken down into habitats, which is which is kind of interesting. And I, yeah, I think we have a lot of debate about how to unpack that term, and that's definitely one way of doing it. So um, our intention is to write a report of this workshop. Uh, I'll just remind you that so we will try and provide a distillation of all of these discussions in that report. And I'll just remind you that um, uh, there is still time to interact with these exercises until the close of the whole overall workshop. And I should also, something I, I didn't mention in my introduction is that before we leave tonight, we do have a sort of exit poll on what kinds of products people would like to produce as a community rather than um, stuff that comes from the workshop organisers. So have a think about that. But now I'm going to hand over to Emma, who's going to provide some closing comments. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Simeon. And thanks, everyone, for, for staying to the end and for participating. Um, it was really cool. Um, well, I really enjoyed the discussions and I know I've certainly learned a lot from everyone today. So, yeah, let's should we do that exit poll now, Heather? Um, so one last poll, one last task. Um, if you go in the chat and click that link and you will have the chance to vote for your what you think would be the most useful kind of next step from the whole community. Um, that maybe could follow on from this workshop. So as we've said, we will write a report um, which will go on the OCB website and everybody can, can find that in the future. Um, but really we want these workshops to kind of start something and like start collaborations and um, start you know building a community and it's not necessarily going to be us that takes this work forward it can be other members of this community so um but yeah we'll publish these results as well and and you know make some recommendations on how we think the whole community could move forward so um yeah it's quite hard to read the writing but um it'll be interesting to see how this compares and whilst we just uh, wait for those results to come in or maybe that's is that all of them heather <laughs>
more, more, com more still coming in. Um, just a, a reminder that um, Rashid and Rebecca are running the next, and so the next session, session three in the final session, which will be um, more along the lines of that final question in our discussion group. So all about how management might have impacts so managing fisheries for carbon sequestration what might the societal impacts be so it'd be much more around the social science and also policy so really hope that you we can see some of you or most of you there tomorrow um, there's a link just going in the chat now for you to to find out more information and sign up it's in a totally different time zone so those of you joining from New Zealand and uh, that side of the world will have a much nicer nicer time um of it and um yeah i think that was the main um points really just um yeah let's just keep engaging and just thank you ever so much for for coming um and thank you so much to ocb for hosting this and heather and may for all of your wonderful work but um yeah these results are looking so what we got we've got published paper um i can't even read this properly it makes me feel very old <laughs> But yeah, there's some few things coming up, some more follow on workshops. Um, I think we've definitely uh, found there's quite a lot to discuss in these um, in these topics. Um, and Vili's asked, will these presentations be available? Just want to answer quickly. I think that, that it's all being recorded. I don't know about the presentations because some of it um, is unpublished work. So I don't think we could share them with everyone as, you know, where you could take them away necessarily. But the recordings will certainly be available of with the content on the OCB website. So I think we'll we'll close there and give you 10 minutes of free time. And yeah, thank you everyone and have a great rest of your day or evening. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Thank you, bye-bye.